Thank you for joining me for my third book talk. Uh, these books are all intended for an adult audience and they're simply books that I have um, enjoyed over the years and the stories have stuck in my brain sometimes for a very long time. I hope you find one that you too will enjoy. The Giant's House by Elizabeth McCracken. 26-year-old librarian Peggy Court lives a lonely, solitary life in a small town on Cape Cod. She has measured her short life and already found it to be lacking. Then one day she meets James Carlson Sweat and everything changes for her. She cannot help but notice 11-year-old James when he comes into the library during a school field trip. He is easily the tallest person in the room at six foot two. But it is not just his height that draws Peggy in. James is Peggy's perfect patron. He is curious and intelligent and always seeking. Not only does he ask for books that the library has, he also asks for books that the library doesn't have. And as their friendship grows, he challenges Peggy's cynicism and her suspicion of people in general. They are odd candidates for friendship, but nevertheless, they soon find themselves uh, and their lives entwined. In James, Peggy discovers the one person who truly understands her and the one person that she can give herself to. As he grows six foot five at age 12, then seven feet, then eight, so does her heart and their most unique relationship. To read about this relationship, read The Giant's House, A Romance by Elizabeth McCracken. Parish Trout by Pete Dexter. In Parish Trout, Pete Dexter takes us to Ether County, Georgia. In the spring, a year or two after the end of World War II. And at this time, there is a rabies epidemic. The rabies are, for the most part, carried by foxes and affect farmers and their livestock. But there are two reports of people being bitten. Um, and those reports come from an area outside of Cotton Point, Georgia, called Damp Bottoms. Damp Bottoms is the poor black area um, of Cotton Point. One of the reports is of a 14-year-old girl named Rosie Sayers. Rosie Sayers lives in the bottoms with her mother and 12 brothers and sisters. And she is sent one day to Paris Trout Store in town to buy a box of 22 shells for her mother to give to one of her special visitors. On the way home from the store, she encounters a rabbit fox. And when she sees the fox, she starts to back away slowly and begs the fox, please, Mr. Fox, don't poison me. Rosie has heard from her brothers that foxes are poisonous, worse than snakes even. And um, she's terrified of that, among other things. So when she turns to run, uh, the fox is immediately on her and she sees a blur of red tangled in her feet and as she falls she kicks the fox away and before she even hits the ground the fox is gone but it's too late she's already been bitten despite this encounter with the fox and the bite on her leg Rosie did not die of rabies um, she did not live long enough to even find out if she had contracted the disease. Rosie instead died of something that is of a far greater danger to a poor black girl in the deep south at that time. She was shot multiple times by 
store owner Parrish Trout. He uh, was a white business owner and respected citizen in Cotton Point. The impact of Rosie's death infects the community of Cotton Point and its citizens as Parrish Trout is put on trial and their own hypocrisies begin to be exposed. So to learn more about Cotton Point and Parish Trout, read Parish Trout by Pete Dexter. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, step right up to the astounding Carnival Fabulon. Be amazed and horrified by a family like no other. Patriarch and ringmaster Al Benuski. Matriarch and geek. Crystal Lil Benuski and their troop of children and almost children. Conceived with the help of various drugs and radioactive isotopes, these children will thrill and disgust you. You will cringe in horror in the gallery of could have been children. You will not be able to tear your eyes away from Arturo the Aqua Boy. Your ears will never forget the sweet sounds produced by Siamese twins Ellie and Iffy. Albino hunchback dwarf Olympia is a sight to behold. And Fortunato? Words cannot describe his abilities. You'll have to see him to believe. Marvel at the disturbing lives of these unfortunate characters but try not to recognize the way these chillingly inhuman characters are so hauntingly human, like you. Geek Love by Katherine Dunn. The Answer to the Riddle is Me, a memoir of amnesia by David Stuart McLean. He is standing when he comes to, not lying down. The waking isn't gradual, rather it is darkness, 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 snap, awake. It is hot. The man stands on a train platform. The sweat and humidity make his shirt cling to his body. Before him is a train, red and shuddering. Around him, Crowds of brown-skinned people flow past him in all directions. He feels he is the only still thing in this universe. Even the air shimmers from the heat and diesel exhaust. When the train pulls away, he waves back at the people waving from the open windows. And it's only then that he realizes the startling whiteness of his own arm. He is foreign. He knows enough then to check his person for a train ticket or a passport for some clue to his presence in this country, on this platform, in this body. He has no ticket or passport. He also has no money. He looks at the television monitor hanging from a metal rafter, and the letters on the screen are unfamiliar. He thinks for a moment he has forgotten how to read until the screen changes and he can suddenly read the words on it. Jan Mabumi Express, Bhubaneshwar Express. He reads the words, but they mean as little to him as they did when he could not read them. A man taps him on the shoulder. Is there something the matter here, he asks. And the man on the platform answers. I have no idea who I am. The answer to the riddle is me by David Stewart McLean. The Unseen World by Liz Moore. Would you like a drink, she asked Jordy, as she had been taught, and then led him down the hallway toward the kitchen, where David greeted him. 
Geordi took the gin ricky in his hands, putting his lips to the rim of the glass, ignoring the straw. Did you make these? He asked Ada about the drink, and she told him that she did, fixating on the grammatical mix-up he had let slip, pondering its structure. Delicious, he said. Wherever did you learn? From my father, she told him. Ada Sibelius had learned everything from her brilliant, eccentric, socially inept single father, David. Homeschooled, she spent most of her days in the computer science lab that he ran at the Boston Institute of Technology. Um, she worked on her homework alongside David and his colleagues. And at night, David taught her French and uh, narrated historical movements to her and assigned her literature. Um, so by the time Ada was 12 years old, she was a painfully shy prodigy. Most of her interactions to that point were with adults, and she thought of David's colleagues at the lab as her colleagues as well. She also thought of them, in a way, as her family. When Ada begins to notice that something is not right with her father, she has no one to turn to. She doesn't have a mother because she had been born by surrogate to David when he was 46 years old. And he had never even shown an inclination toward dating or providing her with a mother. Ada cannot even talk to David himself about his memory lapses and forgetfulness um, because he seems unwilling to acknowledge that they're happening. She knows that she must keep David's condition a secret, though, because um, she needs to protect his dignity, but she also needs to protect herself from being taken away by authorities. When David's condition is finally discovered, Ada is left a virtual orphan. But she is taken in by David's friend, neighbor, and colleague, Diana Liston. And at this time, Ada is thrown into the vibrant, loud, complicated Liston household with Diana and her three sons. And she enters school for the first time as an eighth grader. It is Ada's first real encounter with children her own age. And it's a whole new world for her. Not always a good world whole new world. <laughs> As David deteriorates, it is discovered that he has been harboring secrets that may be locked away forever now. With the help of the Listons and her colleagues at the lab, Ada begins a mission to uncover her father's secrets, and this journey shapes her childhood and her adulthood go with Ada on her journey into the unseen world by Liz Moore.